Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts. As I just said, we have people from all over the world here because we are welcoming author and historian Tony Mount to our virtual stage talking about how to survive in medieval England. Because, like, don't we need to know this? Like, I mean, if if we were ever to perfect a time machine, we would totally need this information. So take your notes, be ready for that time machine. Before we get started though, I would like to say a couple things. One, I'd like to thank the um, Friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming. I would like to thank Tony who allowed us to share this program with several other libraries in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And I will put a list of them in the chat because when libraries work together, you know, we totally make magic and we have today for sure. Um, as I said, you can buy signed books from Tony at Aesop's Fable. I'll put a link in the chat. And um, during her presentation, I'm going to close the chat to um, for you guys, but if you want, because it's very distracting, but if you want to chat with me, you are more, well, more than welcome to, because um, if you have a tech issue or anything like that, I will turn the chat back on after Tony's presentation. If you have a question though, please put it in the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, because that's much easier for me to keep track of. So Tony Mount has written this amazing book, How to Survive in Medieval England. It came out last year. And um, when I reached out to her, she immediately was like, yes, I want to talk. I love this story. I want to talk about it. But she also writes his medieval historical mysteries. And, um, you know, she has a book on, you know, how to survive in Tudor England. She's just like the authority on this. So we're very happy to have you here, Tony. Thank you so much for spending your, for you, Saturday afternoon with us. <laughs> well, thank you, Mina, for inviting me and welcome, everyone. So, yes, my book, How to Survive in Medieval England. The idea of it is that imagine you were transported back to the Middle Ages and had start a new life without cell phones, sat nav or social media. How would you manage? So my talk this morning will give you some advice on what to expect and what you'll need to know. Now in early medieval times, there were three social classes described as those who fight, those who pray, and those who work the land. And this last group is by far the largest. By the later medieval period, there is a growing middling class of tradesmen, craftsmen, and merchants, which rather messes up this neat pattern of what was reckoned to be God's own perfect design. So where would you, as a traveler in time, fit into the design? Now, supposing you are destined to be the most humble of all, they're called serfs, not peasants. England has never had peasants. Paysan is the French word meaning country dwellers. And the English use the term peasant to describe the poorest of their traditional French enemies and they mean it as an insult. Even the so-called peasants result revolt, which you might have heard of, that occurred in England in 1381, is a more recent name for the uprising. At the time, it's called the revolt of the commons, in other words, the common people. And even the term serf for these lowest of the low is almost gotten by the 14th century. So if you travel back in time, where would 
where would you live? Now, the poorest live in one room hovels. The walls are made of wattle and daub, which consists of woven panels of twigs, usually of willow or hazel, fixed to a wooden framework. The wattle is then covered with daub, a mixture of mud, animal dung and straw, and it's smoothed on to fill the gaps. When dry, Daub sets hard as plaster and keeps out the weather. It can be painted with lime wash, which not only colours it white, but helps prevent it growing mould, as well as putting off vermin to some extent. Although it'll probably need annual repairs. Windows are simply small gaps left in the wattle panels and are very few in number to avoid losing warmth or letting in wind and rain. Wooden shutters cover these gaps at night and in the worst weather, so your hovel might be very dark. Window glass is reserved for churches and even the wealthy don't have glazed windows much before the 14th century. Your hovel will be heated by an open fire in a central hearth on which the cooking is also done. There's no chimney and smoke escapes through the windows, doorways and any gaps in the roof. The roof is probably thatched with reeds if these grow locally or with cut turf. At night and in cold weather, you bring your livestock inside to share your hovel. And in return for putting up with the stink and having dung on the floor, you get the benefit of their extra warmth. I'm afraid your bedding will be very basic. A sack stuffed with straw is your mattress on the floor with a blanket. If available, I advise you to use bracken as the stuffing instead. Creatures like fleas and bedbugs are not very keen on bracken, preferring straw. And I'm afraid hay, though much softer, is not an option because it's used to feed your animals in winter. And even things like sheets and pillows are for better off people. Now, villains or cottars are the next level up. They do better than serfs and have their cottages. Although these are sometimes built of the same materials as the serfs hovel, they usually have two rooms, one for you and one for the livestock. The human half of the house may have a sort of mezzanine for use as a bedroom reached by a ladder. Windows may be a bit larger and use oiled parchment or thin sheets of horn to make semi-transparent coverings. These materials let in the light and keep out the weather but they're not transparent, so you can't admire the view. Your cooking facilities won't be much different from those of the surf, but you may have more cups, bowls, dishes and spoons, all of what's called treen ware, that is made of wood, or possibly 
from cheap pottery. You might say some chicken feathers and bake them beside the fire to remove parasites. And you can then stuff pillows with them. And your blankets might well be of better quality than the serfs. Cottages usually have a back door out to the toft or garden plot. And here the villains grow pot herbs such as onions, leeks, cabbages, parsnips, turnips, radishes and beets to extend their menu or sell the surplus at market. Other herbs can include lavender to keep clothes fresh and put off the moths. Sage is grown for flavouring and medicinal purposes. And a plant called meadowsweet is ideal to strew on the floor and perfume the air as you walk on it. And it's also an excellent headache remedy. So in the right hand picture here of your garden plot, you can see that little building it looks like a shed just outside the fence. That is your toilet. Yes, that's, that's your bathroom. Now, suppose you're better off than a villain. You might be of the up and coming middling sort, in which case you'll probably live in a town or even a city. London, Bristol, Norwich, Southampton and York are the most important medieval cities. Most townhouses also have a garden plot where the women of the household grow vegetables and herbs, just like their country dwelling sisters. And they often keep animals as well. Uh, chickens, pigs in particular, because they're very easy to feed on scraps. Um, possibly a goat, or if you've got room, a cat. Now, compared to the labourer's hovel, your house in town might be quite comfortable, especially by the 15th century, as more people can afford to have chimneys and a few luxuries. Furniture is still quite sparse, but appearing in greater variety and in more homes. Stools, benches, and trestle boards, that is, tables which rest on trestles, are now joined by settles with cushions to be your sofa, cup boards, which are literally boards to put your cup on rather than closets, and buffets which are sort of like Welsh dress-ups, a place to display your silverware <coughs> or your pewterware. So we're now looking at um, a rather better off people. But of course, throughout medieval times, life will be more pleasant if you're rich and nothing's changed there. By the 13th century, life is becoming more comfortable for ladies like the Countess of Leicester, who was the wife of Simon de Montfort. She has such luxuries as a private bedchamber, a solar, which is a sort of a retiring room, and a pleasure garden. The Countess's brother, King Henry III of England, 
is the first monarch here to have private bathrooms built at his favourite residences. Although beautifully tiled, the water still has to uh, be heated and carried in by the bucketful by its servants and emptied out the same way because they haven't yet invented plug holes or main drainage. The Countess's husband, Simon de Montfort, disapproves of such decadence, so there are no bathrooms in his castles. But tapestries adorn the walls, an improvement brought from Simon's native France. Wall paintings may look beautiful, but they can't keep out the drafts and they don't impress visitors nearly so much as an expensive tapestry hanging. Now, this is uh, Stokesay Castle, which is over towards the Welsh border. The solar here <clears throat> is the best room. By the 14th century, windows in the solar <clears throat> are larger to let in more light. They may even be glazed as here because glass is becoming a rich man's luxury, no longer used only to honour God in churches. Chimneys appear and the main hall, kitchen and solar are usually the first rooms to benefit from this innovation. You can just see the fireplace over on the right hand side. Once there are chimneys, you don't have to rely on smoke escaping through windows and gaps in the roof. So ceilings and upper floors become possible, as do well-fitting window casements, which can be opened or closed to suit the weather. Castles are becoming cosier, at least for the important people. Ladies do their sewing and embroidery in the solar where the light is best. And as more and more people become literate, it's a good place for reading, either to yourself or more likely as a shared activity, reading aloud to others. That uh, famous writer, Geoffrey Chaucer, read his Canterbury Tales allowed to King Richard II's court. Now this is the Great Hall at Stokesay. It hasn't fared as well as the sonar, but you can see this is the main communal space of the castle or even of a smaller manor house. It may be large enough to accommodate hundreds or just a couple of dozen people may be cramped in a lesser manners hall. Originally, the hall had been the only living room used for eating, entertaining, holding court and even sleeping. But as the medieval period progresses, separate rooms evolve for different purposes. Big occasions like Christmas or weddings will be celebrated in the hall where everyone can eat together, enjoy the entertainments and dance. However, the lower servants will probably be sleeping in the hall when the feasting and dancing is done. Is done. Perhaps four times a year, 
his lordship will also still hold court here in the great hall, hearing pleas and petitions, adjudicating legal cases, approving marriages and new tenancies and such like. But wherever you live, in whatever kind of dwelling, to survive in the medieval times, beware of fire. Open hearths, candles, and artificial lighting of any kind will involve a naked flame. And if you go out after dark, you'll be required by law to carry a torch. Not just to see your way, because there are no street lights, but show you are a respectable person going about your legitimate business. Without a burning torch in your hand, you may be arrested by the night watch, who will assume you are a felon up to no good. So that just about deals with um, where you might be living. But of course, a major question, what is there to eat and drink? Well, if you're a serf, food, like all your amenities, is poor and plain. Your bread will be made of flour and water and probably unrisen. The flour will have to be ground from the grain grown in your Lord's fields, but he lets you have a share in exchange for your hard work on his land. And wives and children are allowed to glean the fields after the cereals are harvested, collecting up fallen ears of wheat, barley or rye or the tops of the oats for their own use. And this tradition goes back to biblical times. This means your flour will often be a mixture of grains and it's called maslin. Now, a paste of flour and water can be baked into flatbreads on a hot hearthstone. Dried peas and beans will also be part of your wages, like the grain. And these can be stewed up in a pot on the fire to make pottage. The thicker, the better. This can be flavored with any vegetables the Lord allows you to take from his field or else from plants that grow wild in the hedgerows. Wild carrots may be an option, but you really need to know your plants because wild carrot is very similar in appearance to hemlock water dropwort and its cousins, all of which are deadly poisonous. Stinging nettles might not sound appetizing, but their fresh green tops taste like spinach and make good addition to pottage. And there are also other plants like the one on the right, which is called fat, fat hen. It grows wild and it's a free ingredient. Now, if you are poor, meat is going to be a luxury. Hard cheeses, and I mean really hard cheese, made with skimmed milk, has to be softened by soaking before you can eat it. These cheeses can be kept on the rafters above the hearth, where they're constantly smoked and last so long 
they are sometimes bequeathed in people's wills to the next generation. Soft cheeses like cream cheese and cottage cheese are meant for the rich man's table. And it's all a case of grow your own. So here we've got a peasant's hovel with a few cabbages growing in the garden, but they're also making use of plants growing in the hedgerow to uh, add to their uh, larder. Now, towards the end of the medieval period, recipes, which they called receipts, start to be written down and shared. But measurements and cooking times are rarely given. The reasons are that weighing things out in pounds and ounces, definitely not kilos and grams, isn't possible for the average cook without weighing scales. You buy flour by the sack full, milk by the jug, and butter by the pat. Everything is judged by eye and experience counts. It's the same with cooking times. Whether baking in the oven or an open hearth, there are no thermometers. You just have to test the food to see when it's cooked. And of course, you can't time it by the clock. Uh, it's quite interesting that occasionally they do give cooking times and they usually time it by how long it takes you to say the Lord's Prayer. So it'll be stir the mixture for the time it takes you to say five paternosters, which is Latin for our father. Sadly, since poor folk can't read or write, recipes are pointless to them. So all the cookery notes that have survived that we can see today are for the better off who can read them. There is a recipe for blancmange, but don't expect a sweet standing custard. Blancmange simply means white food, and it's a posh recipe using the luxuries of tender chicken, rice, almonds, and possibly even sprinkled with sugar. The addition of sugar might surprise you, but medieval people have no hesitation in mixing sweet with savoury. And if you can afford them, sugar and spices are symbols of affluence, so you should use them at every opportunity. So, what is there? to drink. Well, ale is the best and most healthy drink to go with your bread and pottage. The local water may be polluted with animal droppings or contain bugs or pathogens of one sort or another. Boiling the water will make it safer to drink, but nobody realises that. You can tell them, of course, while you're on your visit. However, brewing ale involves boiling the water. And thus, inexplicably, ale is a safe drink. Even children drink the second week of brewing. The problem is that brewing takes days to achieve and some expensive equipment is required, such as vats and strainers. So to overcome this, the equipment often belongs to the whole village, 
rather than individual families and passes to a different household each week when it's their turn to brew ale for the whole village. When a batch is ready for drinking, it's traditional to hang a bunch of green leaves over the door, or in the case of this picture, it seems the woman's put her broom up there. It's a bit strange. And then everyone knows to bring their jugs to be refilled. But fresh ale is only drinkable for about a week before it goes sour. But by that time, another household has a fresh brewing ready to be shared. Now, one very important aspect, of course, about traveling back in time is that England in the Middle Ages is not always a healthy place, particularly in the crowded, unhygienic towns and cities. Epidemic diseases are a fact of life. But out in the countryside, the air is clean and pollution usually concerns a neighbour's livestock stirring up the water and urinating in the river, or the washerwoman's soap tainting the street. However, you have to be aware of other health issues. There are no insecticides, fungicides, weed killers, or artificial fertilizers sprayed on the crops, which sounds like the healthy option until you realize what it means. There's rarely an unblemished apple or cabbage leaves without holes chewed by insects. Mold, which is a fungus, can be a serious hazard. Ergot, is a mould which particularly grows on grain crops and especially rye if the weather is too damp. And eating bread made with infected grain may cause hallucinations and even a kind of mad hysteria. And if the entire village is affected, it can be a very serious matter. There are also uh, parasitic diseases that you'll need to be aware of. Thyme, lavender and ladies' bed straw can all help to get rid of uh, fleas and bugs and things like that. And if you get to take your anti-malaria pills before you journey back in time, Lavender water is very good at deterring mosquitoes, which in the Middle Ages in southern England, malaria was a problem. Now, whether you're in the town or country, you are probably most at risk from death by accident. This could be as dramatic as a mishap with a scythe at harvest time, severing some vital part, or it may be something minor, like a splinter in your thumb. Without any scientific knowledge of antibiotics, any injury, however small, can result in infection, sepsis, and possibly death. But take heart, all is not lost. Just because medieval folk have never heard of antibiotics doesn't mean they don't have them. Wounds are washed with wine, if available. Red wine for preference. Red wine being a dark red liquid is believed to inspire your body to produce more blood to replace what has been lost. But it also happens to be a very good antiseptic. Surgeons know how to pack 
open wounds so they heal from the inside out using sphagnum moss or maybe even cobwebs, both of which have antibiotic properties. Surgeons are skilled at stitching and cauterizing wounds as well. And cobwebs can be used to staunch bleeding, helping the blood to clot and form a scab. Quite a few medieval remedies make use of vinegar being left to stand in a brass pot for some days. Vinegar reacts with copper in the brass to produce copper salts, which are another excellent antibiotic. And they understand that honey smeared onto any wound acts as a seal, and it also acts as an antibiotic, antiviral he healing agent. Now, living in town, typhoid fever, typhus, dysentery, measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria and smallpox, are just some of the epidemics that snatch away lives in alarming numbers. But most feared of all, after its first visitation to England in 1348, is the plague. These diseases have no respect for rank. A king is as susceptible as a commoner. But at least you might think royalty can afford to take countermeasures. Even in the 13th century, the connection between dirt and disease is understood, although it's described in terms of foul airs. In other words, things that smell nasty are bad for your health, rather than bacteria and viruses. And it's understood that a clean house is a healthy house. So you want to get rid of those fleas for definite. There are two schools of thought on what to do when plague breaks out. Pray hard, avoid sin, and be virtuous, so God might see fit to spare you. Or else, enjoy life to the full while you can. But at least you, knowing plague is passed on by flea bites, can be generous with the insect repellents. Lavender and thyme are excellent. The plant called flea biting is not so efficient, but you should encourage your new friends to do the same. So now we've got you housed and fed and hopefully keeping healthy. But what should you wear? Now, if you are a surf, everyone ranks higher than you on the social ladder. Men, you must make sure you always wear a cap of some sort because you'll have to doff it. Lower your eyes and bend the knee a little to just about everybody you meet, except those few who are worse off than you. You can tell the states that men or women by their dress. Whereas you wear dull, colourless, shapeless garments of coarse homespun cloth, your betters, which just about everybody else, will be clad in more colourful textiles. Dyes are expensive, and so is quality cloth. So the robes of the wealthier classes are long, voluminous, and brightly coloured. Your clothes will be made of natural fibres 
such as wool and linen and silk if you're of high status or textiles that are a mixture of these. There are no easy care, non-iron, permanent press or drip dry, I'm afraid. Although, in a way, everything is non-iron because irons haven't been invented yet. And woolen clothes are hardly ever washed, though this isn't such a bad thing, as we'll see. Instead of ironing, linen garments, sheets, tablecloths and table napkins and such like are pulled straight while wet from laundering, dried and then folded neatly and put into a press until needed. If done properly, items come out smooth and wrinkle free. From my own experience as a historical reenactor, I can tell you that natural fibres are wonderful to wear if you do so correctly. They're comfortable, warm in winter and cool in summer. Now, woolens are difficult to wash because they become sodden and heavy and pull out of shape and may well shrink. So it's important to prevent them from becoming soiled in the first place. For this reason, you never wear wool next to the skin where it will get sweaty and smelly. Linen underwear is a must and most people change it every day, except for the poorest who can't afford spare clothes. Rich people may change their undies two or three times a day, simply because they can and they don't have to do their own laundry. Now for women, girls and children, both sexes, until they're toilet trained, underwear consists of a linen smock, sometimes called a shift or a chemise. Length varies, but around knee length for children and mid-calf or longer for women, usually with long sleeves. The shift protects your skin from chafing by any woolen out garment and freely absorbs sweat, protecting the clothes worn on top. Now it used to be thought that medieval women wore no such things as bras and knickers, despite a couple of medieval manuscripts referring to breast bags, possibly as being worn well padded by prostitutes to enhance their assets. But in Lengberg Castle in Austria in 2008, discoveries were made that required new thinking. Beneath the floorboards put in place in the 15th century, the gap had been packed with rags to reduce drafts and noise. And amongst the rags were found bras and tie up the hip briefs. So as a historical enactor, I can wear my underwear. Now, medieval men, wear undershirts and something like baggy boxers shorts held up with a drawstring, all of linen. There is no elastic, so everything has tapes, ties, pins or lacings. Over the undershirt, a man may choose to wear a second shirt, perhaps with embroidery or trimmings that are meant to show. This won't be worn next to the skin, otherwise it'll need frequent washing, which will spoil the decorative features. 
everyone wears hose or stockings. For men, these are long enough to tie to the bottom hem of your undershirt. And split hose can be virtually a pair of pants in two halves tied to the shirt at the side and with a cod piece to cover any embarrassment. The cod piece in medieval times is just a modest flap tied in place until Henry VIII turns the cod piece into a literally huge fashion statement in the 16th century. If he hadn't been king, he would probably have been a laughing stock. Women's hose tend to be shorter, just over the knee, and with little buckled straps to hold them in place. Now, what you wear on top of your underclothes will depend on the fashions of the day and your wealth. For women, a long tunic or kirtle is usual with an overgown or surcoat on top. But fashions change. Gowns are girdled, that is belted, at hip level for much of the period. But by the 15th century, high-waisted styles are all the fashion. Sleeves may be tightly fitting or flowing and are often removable, as in this picture, simply being tied to the gown at the shoulder, which also allows for sweaty underarms not spoiling the gown. For men, a short top, such as a rough jerkin for common folk or a stylish doublet, for the fashionable bow goes over your shirt. Above that, you may wear an overgown. Lengths vary greatly according to your age and what's in fashion. Generally, young men wear short gowns, sometimes indecently so, while older men like to keep their knees warm. And of course, floor length robes are also a way to show your wealth because of the extra cloth required. If money is no object and your rank allows, according to the sumptuary laws, your out gown can be of the most expensive textiles. Exotic imports such as silk, velvet, satin, taffeta, brocade, damask, and of course cloth of gold, in which gold thread is woven through the silk on the loom. The most expensive dyes are crimson, royal blue, and purple. But towards the end of the 15th century, black becomes a big fashion statement. Not only is black dye very costly, it fades quickly. So anyone wearing a truly black gown must be clad in a new ensemble and have servants to keep it free of dust, flecks, lint and dandruff. Now, for cold weather, furs are essential as linings and trimmings. And again, sumptuary laws will tell you what you may wear. Cat fur is the humblest. Anyone can wear it. But many furs were imported from the Baltic lands. That sort of Eastern Europe and Russia and uh, the Eastern Scandinavia. Black sable, white fox, ermine from the stoat in its winter coat and miniver are some of the most prestigious furs. Now miniver, sometimes just known as fur, VR, is a white bellied fur of a red squirrel. 
in the French fairy tale Cinderella, the heroine wore glass slippers to the ball. In fact, in the original, they were the slippers. An English mistake in translating them as their B-E-R-R-E, -R -R -E, which is French for glass. I mean, how could you dance in glass shoes? Right, so now you're dressed and fit to be seen, but you need to be able to behave correctly. Now, although in the 21st century, it seems to be thought that medieval people were dirty, and rarely bothered to wash, you'll find this isn't true. Every morning you'll be expected to wash your face, hands and neck, and usually your feet as well, before saying your first prayers to God. If you can't bear to be without a deodorant, the local apothecary will sell you a piece of alum stone which, if wetted, can be applied underarm like a roll-on deodorant and left to dry. It does work. Meal times require elaborate hand washing, as in this picture, before you eat, during the meal, if necessary, making use of finger bowls, and also at the end of the meal. Good table manners are essential. And what you say can also get you into trouble. If you're taken by surprise or drop something heavy on your toe, four-letter words probably won't raise many eyebrows. But OMG, as you send on your cell phone to your friend, is blasphemy in the Middle Ages. Taking the Lord's name in vain in any way will see you in the church courts having to pay a fine. And don't swear. Swearing means you have taken an oath before God. And if you break that oath, you will be treated with utter contempt and they will consider your soul lost to God. A few words that are quite common to us have changed their meanings. Do not tell a woman she looks nice. It's not a compliment. Nice means fussy and describes a wife who nags and finds fault. Don't tell a child he's naughty. Naughty refers to being nothing, not even human, and is a word to describe murderers and rapists, not mischievous toddlers. However, even a clever child is silly. It means sweet and innocent. And don't use that popular expression, it's amazing to describe a friend's efforts at cookery or carpentry or poetry. It doesn't mean marvellous, but something as bewildering and confusing as being lost in a maze. So having learned what a few words mean, and these just a sample, I advise you to keep quiet when you first arrive and listen well. Ordinary people are speaking English, but at first it will sound like a foreign language until you get used to it. I suggest you say as little as possible to begin with, because your accent will mark you out as an alien, not a being from Mars, but a foreigner. Whether they are called strangers, that's someone from another village, foreigners from another county with a different accent, 
or aliens from another country of a different language. Such people are always the most likely to be blamed for a crime or suspected of causing any local misfortune. If sheep go missing or the stream dries up, any visitor is the first to come under suspicion. In a village, a stranger is immediately recognised because he isn't familiar and everyone knows their neighbours. But since such people don't look very different, unless their fashions are unique in some way, in a town, people are usually identified by their accents. So there we have it a few tips on what to expect if you travel back to medieval times in England. And for more about blending in and how to keep safe, my book, How to Survive in Medieval England, will be your trusty companion full of vital information and useful hints. And the new book, How to Survive in Tudor England, came out in the States last month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. That's amazing. Oh my gosh, how much information did you just give us in an hour so that we could survive, or at least try to, <laughs> through our time machines? So I'm just going to take a couple of questions because we have a few more minutes. Um, uh, a few years, Polly says a few years ago, there were some TV shows where they took modern people and put them in medieval settings to see if they would survive. How realistic do you think they were if you got a chance to see any of them? Um, I'm afraid I didn't see any of those. <laughs> um, we have had that sort of thing here and they have tried to be very realistic um, and they seem to get on okay. One to say just, Stopped um, expecting to get stuff out the fridge or open a packet and uh, turn the light on with flick the switch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, uh, they managed, people haven't changed physically that much. Very true. Um, just the resources that we have are. So I just want to remind everybody if they have a question to put it in the q and I am paying attention to that. Um, Natalie says, where did they get sugar in medieval times? I actually didn't even think they had salt back then. Uh, sugar was cane sugar, which um, medieval times was grown in various Mediterranean countries, North Africa. It was certainly grown in what is today Israel mm -hmm. um, there and southern Spain, which had an Arab population, they brought in um, sugar quite early. It's proper cane sugar, not beet sugar. And if you visit the island of Cyprus, they've still got the ruins of a 15th century sugar refinery is on the tourist trail. Awesome. Um, so Tony did agree to have a, a talk on her book, How to Survive in Tudor England with us uh, on October 26th. I will send that link out to everybody um, as after this session. But uh, the question was here, how, when will your book, How to Survive in Victorian England, come out? I just saw that on your website. No, I'm not writing one. <laughs> there oh. is a Victorian England now, there's um, one coming out in September, which is Anglo-Saxon England. So that's yeah. going back a bit, yes. not Victorian. <laughs> and I'm currently writing How to Survive in Wartime Britain. This is Second World War. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, a book oh. I'm making, yeah, Second World Wars will be the fourth one. 
I'm not doing Victorians, so okay. not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody was just asking as a suggestion, but I do remember seeing the Anglo-Saxon one on your website. Um, yeah. Jackie asks, how did people initially become designated as higher ranking than a serf? Oh, well, that goes right back to prehistory. Mm -hmm. Guy with the uh, biggest spear and the best bow and arrow <laughs> um, naturally bossed the others around. And he caught more food than they did. So, yeah, the haves and the have-nots must go right the way back to the Stone Age. By the time you get to the Anglo-Saxons, you've got people calling themselves kings. Mm -hmm. Now you've got their band of what we would call knights, they're warriors, um, and there are priests. And then there's all the rest to do what they're told, labor on the land, and literally feed all the people higher up the social ladder. Mm -hmm. So oh. that goes forever. <laughs> I think that's everywhere. Tony, um, would you mind just staying on for like five more minutes to take a couple more questions? Or yeah, of course. Okay. Stephen asks, what was the average lifespan of people in the medieval times? Excellent question, Stephen. And if you read the books, they will tell you the average was probably about 35. Mm -hmm. However, the average is very misleading. It's that low because small children caught measles, mumps, whooping coughs, got a fever, but who knows what, they probably died. They might have been a bit malnourished. So if you survived to 14, 15, you were doing well. But be most, an awful lot of very high percentage children died before their fifth birthday. If you got to be a young adult, you were doing well. Yeah. But then women, died in childbirth, that brings the average down even more. Mm -hmm. Young, healthy men died fighting. They died in farm accidents. Absolutely lots of sharp blades, axes and whatever. That brings it down. However, if you survive to adulthood, if you were perhaps um, a nun, a priest, you could live into your 80s. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of examples of church people in particular, but also lords and ladies who, because they had a decent diet, lived into their 80s. I have heard that as well. Um, yes. Pam says, at that time, how far would most common people travel to find a spouse? Oh, yes, tricky question. Um, in the beginning, um, the next village was probably as far as she went. It was understood that intermarriage wasn't a good idea. Despite that, that's what the upper classes tended to do because they didn't want to water down their blue blood, but mm -hmm. um, they paid the price. However, for ordinary people, uh, the next village, but you were limited because the lord of the manor would give you permission to marry. Hmm. So he didn't want you, he didn't want to lose um, strong young men. So it was always the girls who went to the husband's village. But if the girl had a particular skill that the Lord didn't want to lose, he might not even allow that. 
but by the time of the Black Death in the mid 14th century, all those rules break down and suddenly people are traveling much further. Um, if you were wealthy, <clears throat> the chances were your parents or even the king might have a say in who you went. But for the middling people living in town, you could choose your, choose your own just about. Though quite often your master, if you were an apprentice, would uh, have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, this is an interesting question. Given the lack of lower body maintenance, how did women and men handle problems such as bladder infections? Did they just live in pain? Oh, um, well, they did have a lot of um, herbal skills mm -hmm. that we have lost. They knew about plants which would act as uh, very efficient diuretics mm. uh, to uh, improve urine flow and all that, which, um, I mean, nowadays we take cranberry juice and things like that. They would know we didn't have cranberries in England very much and till we imported them along with the turkeys from America. Mm -hmm. But they did know of other things which could help. They understood painkillers. They knew certain herbs would help. Uh, the meadow sweet that I mentioned in the talk, it actually contains aspirin. Mm. Um, so it's brilliant for headaches and period pain and all that sort of thing. So there were remedies, there were ways and means, yes. Mm -hmm. Speaking of period pain, how did women deal with that time of the month? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, they kept linen rags. Mm -hmm. uh, you would start out with the uh, Napkins used at table. Everyone would be wiping their hands on a napkin thrown over their shoulder because there were no forks, of course. Napkins there would eventually be downgraded to what they call tail clouts, what you call diapers mm. for babies, or downgraded for use by women at times of month. Now we know that Queen Elizabeth I, so it's 100 years old, had a sanitary belt to which she could pin her cloths. Mm -hmm. um, but we also know that prostitutes used a particular sort of Mediterranean sponge that was freely available in this country, uh, imported in their millions, called a silk sponge. Mm -hmm. Tend to be quite small and you can trim them to shape and prostitutes would dip them in vinegar and insert them as pessaries to make sure they didn't get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And they could also be used as tampons. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we know that there were also these tie at the hip briefs available. They would help to hold sanitary towels and things like that in place. Mm -hmm. But you'd use them, you'd soak them, wash them, and reuse them mm -hmm. i had heard about the sponges um last question um from peter could you improve your status from surf to hire for example or could you even lose your status back then well if you committed a serious crime yes um in fact during the middle ages 
there were cases where people were accused of a crime, not found guilty or anything, but accused of a crime, and all their possessions would be confiscated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They'd end up with next to nothing. Um, it's actually King Richard III who brings in a law which says that the accused possessions cannot be confiscated until he's found guilty. And even then, such things as the tools of his trade, he must be allowed to keep them because unless he's got a trade, he's not going to be able to pay his fine. Mm. And mm. fines were much more popular than jail sentences. Mm. Um, in medieval times, it was either the death sentence or a fine. Very few people were kept in prison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. oh. Go, Richard. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Things yes. Ending. Yes. So apparently we could just go on and on and um, we still have a bunch more questions. So let's let's end here and come back again in October for the tutor discussion. And Tony, this has been unbelievably fascinating as I suspected it would be. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed it. Oh, you can tell from all of those emojis, people are having a good time. <laughs> so. Excellent. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate that you jumped on this and that you've shared such incredible knowledge with us that we really, you know, uh, hear about things, but it actually is nice to put in one place. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me, Nina. It's been lovely. Thank Excellent. You. Well, have a wonderful day, everybody. And I hope you um, do get to travel back at some point as, uh, as a, a lord or a lady. <laughs> it seems like a lot more fun. <laughs> All Thank right. You very much. Good night, Bye. everybody.